You're not in the wrong place. Sometimes when people come in, I'm like, wait, 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 that's in the wrong room. There must be some baking happening on a different floor. Hi. So I was actually asked to introduce Martin tonight, so I'll be very brief. But uh, my name is Kathleen. Um, I'm a baking instructor at New England Culinary Institute, and I have some fabulous students with me tonight. So we, uh, I was lucky enough to get to know Martin when he was doing some preparation for your competition, the coup de main. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how I and first maybe, maybe even see Jeff too. Maybe you're here yes. for, the, for Italy too. Yeah. Yes, I knew of you, but now I know him, and it's been really yeah. wonderful. You know, Martin has been incredibly generous to my students. We've had some tours at King Arthur. And just his knowledge and passion for bread and the craft has been inspirational, to say the least. Every time he uh, talks about it, I'm like, man, I got to up my game. <laughs> um, but when I heard he had a book coming out and then he was going to be here at Bear Pond, it was a must, must save on my calendar. And I'm just so happy that the book is here. I uh, definitely want to take a look at and do some bread this weekend. And I'm just looking forward to hearing about whatever it is you're going to be talking about yeah. tonight. So a nice, warm welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, and thanks to Bear Pond for hosting the event, which is important and good. Um, the book came out in Technically, I guess it was Halloween, but it really came out in November. And um, since then, I've been in a lot of bookstores and a lot of libraries. Um, and what an honor that is. And I'm serious. Like, what an honor that is to me. Um, bookstores and libraries are great examples for all of us, right? If you think about the diversity of opinion on the shelves, if you think about um, the populations that they serve, high and low, east and west, you know, north and south. It's all out there. It's all down there on the shelves. So um, what a good example that is for all of us, I think. Uh, and so what an honor to be in a, in a bookstore for me. So thank you for having me. Um, it's kind of a weird book. I set out to write it, and I didn't have a plan. I had a contract, but I had no plan. Uh, I didn't have a proposal when I got the contract. Um, I kind of fell into it in a way um, based on some conversations that I had, uh, which led to more conversations. And then next thing you know, um, I was sitting in an office in New York City. And you better hold on to that beer because that's it's really good beer. beer. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Um, no, it really is. Really? Seriously? <laughs> Seriously? Well, no, one turns. Okay. That's stay focused. Stay focused. I've got some beer from after. Alchemist over here. I can't do anything. That's that's after. After. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, so I had some conversations. Next thing you know, I was in an office in New York City uh, with my agent and uh, having a conversation with a publisher. and. Um, passionate conversation. I think when I talk about bread and when I talk about craft, I get um, those are things that are important to me. I think they're important to all of us, whether we realize it or not. Um, but they're important and uh, had a conversation and then we went to two other publishers that day and then um, and we got a book deal. Boom. It was pretty easy. I hate to tell that story to authors because they <laughs> want to like punch me in the face. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you hit the lottery, right? Be careful of lightning and all that stuff. You know, careful what you wish for in terms of luck. But um, so I was fortunate to sort of begin this journey of trying to figure out what it was that I had to say, even though I already had a contract. I had a sense of what I wanted to talk about, but I didn't know how I was going to say it. And so, um, I went to a friend who was one of the uh, sort of wise asses who said, yeah, you should write a book. And I said, oh, great. So I got this contract. Now what the heck do I do? And she said, well, start writing. I said, OK, that's, a good, that's good advice. I guess I didn't know how to write. I'd, I'd, had a, I'd had some writing courses in high school, which someone told me the other day didn't count. Uh, and then I had one in college. My background's in classical music. I went to Oberlin Conservatory and um, sang, sang for a while. Um, but so she said, well, start writing. And so I started trying to figure out what the heck to write. And uh, within like maybe a few hours, I kind of knew. I was like, oh, OK, I guess I'm going to write a story about things that mean something to me. And what are the things that mean to me? Uh, home is something that means something to me. 
heritage, craft, lineage, these are the things that are important to me. And so, so I wrote this story, which I thought at the time was like this creative thing. Uh, I thought I had like an original idea for about two minutes, and then I realized, oh crap, this story that I thought was such a good idea is like the same story that's been told of since the beginning of written history, and maybe before, even oral history preceding it, and that is of uh, a person, all of us, right? You begin in a place, you leave and sort of transformed, right? You experience the metamorphosis, and then you try and come back home, and it's not where you left it, and all of those problems and good things too, right? So I sort of tried to follow the path of the Odyssey, I guess, a little bit. So the book, uh, and I'll read, I won't read too much, I promise. It's, I think it's like, I think I usually say it seven minutes and it's maybe closer to eight or something like that. So I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning and then um, we can see if anybody has any questions. Uh, so I'll read a little bit. My name is Martin Rainey Phillip. Martin is from Martin Chamberlain of Shortsville, New York, a cooper who made barrels and drained them with equal skill, dead of cirrhosis, 1919. Rainey for Thomas Rainey, who left countless Scotch-Irish Rainies in the gray skies of County Armagh, Northern Ireland, for work as a bleach reformer in the toxic woolen mills of Central Falls, Rhode Island, dead of influenza, 1944, and Philip from George Rennie Philip of Aberdeenshire, Scotland, a journeyman stonecutter who traded Scottish granite for Vermont granite and worked himself to death in Barrie, Vermont, dead of exhaustion, 1915. He's actually buried in Rock of Ages. My father grew up in Northfield. To gain a name is an easy thing, a mouth-long chain of consonants and vowels cut and stamped, with a sharp pen stroke one can carve on a family tree for eternity. Census documents hold forests of these trees and branches, and you can climb around in them, moving past a spot of ink here, a correction there, the antique curling scripts counting lives and livelihoods as they wind through centuries of occupations and births. There once was a time when lives were linked to tangible trades and physical connections. The crush of a hammer between arm and stone, palms on spinning bobbins of cotton warp, fingers dragging across fresh sawn staves in a cooperage, a baker's arms bent at the dough trough, pulling and kneading. Once we lived at the intersection of our hands and our materials. And if men's names make paternal ladders with lineage and crests and junior and senior, one of the women, Frances Harriet Chamberlain, occupation blank, Carolyn Rainey Harris, occupation blank, Cora Isabel King, occupation blank. While men passed down names in direct lines, matriarchs lived in round forms, moving from knitting circles to mixing bowls, a wrap of arms around a child. Through these connected embracing forms they have sewn, baked, tended and grown those parts of us which shape rather than name. My grandmother, Carolyn Harris, or Oma as we called her, was a quilter. Her quilting frame, her foundation, hand cut and smoothed by years of use, <coughs> was constructed by her long deceased son. In cold months, the frame was assembled in the living room, equidistant from bed and board where she worked, her face bent close to the frame. This quiet play of hands and material, whether in a bowl of flour, a bucket of bulbs, or quietly pulling a needle and thread at the dimming of day, was her connection, her even song of fingers and heart. Her handcraft was the outward representation of her soul craft. Oma passed this connection to my mother, Frances Phillip, through will or environment, and what emerged in Mama was an entirely alternate form. Where Oma was precise and traditional and classical, my mother blew everything to the moon, scattering scrap quilts from colorful bikinis along the way. <laughs> if Oma was control and adherence, delicate angel food cake for every birthday, 
Mama was hollering, Chinese fire drill at a stoplight with a car full of kids. <laughs> I'm thankful for the contrast, for Mama's ability to improvise, to roll with it, to encourage a baking adventure to never, never land, even in the face of an empty pantry. And I miss Omar, the precision, the formality, the pecan pie with a splash of whiskey, blonde brownies spiked with black walnuts, orange glazed angel food cake, adorned with fresh flowers, treats held in soul's memory. These two distinct lines, the men handing names and a connection to trade, and the women living through example, nurturing with linens, layettes, and food, made their way to my lap as I, attempting to cross stitch, sewed my pants to a cloth napkin on the couch next to my mother. <laughs> Heritage is stamped. Willingly or not, within and without, there are jewels and there are scars. On my arm, the faded white of two holes where I was impaled running in a thicket. The sticks entering my arm and later yanked out under running water by my brother. Despite decades of fresh skin and new memories, the scars still look back at me bearing witness to a time and place where stick punctured arm. And so it is with craft and lineage and hearts and names. Today I reach down through grass and dirt to grasp the roots of this lineage. My wife Julie and I left New York City to bring our family back to Vermont where the first Phillips settled when they came from Scotland. We live at the confluence of rivers and rusty train tracks in a railroad town, and it is here that I give daily embrace to handcraft, trade, and round forms, milling flour on circular stones, mixing doughs and baking bread at King Arthur Flour for my family and communities of happy eaters which encircle us. But today is my day to be counted, to climb and take a place on the family tree to lay down my roots or make the last journey. It is a good day, as I'm proud of my listing. I'm in the right line. I'm in the right place to receive and also give. I'm a baker and flourishing. <clears throat> my path to this good place hasn't been straight. I've been lost. I've moved from roots, heritage, and home before heading back again. And this journey, all of it, <clears throat> began with drop biscuits. I grew up in the creases of the Ozark Mountains, learning to speak with soft mouth and even tones to the night calls of Whippoorwill and Chuck Will's widow. I was the third of six children. We were a mixture of old ways and hippie new ways. We had Foxfire books on the shelf, comfrey in the garden, and cures which favored hair tying for scalp wounds, garlic pills for blood clots, and cider vinegar for everything else. <laughs> Our diet had no meat, preservatives, food coloring, additives, white sugar, or anything else multisyllabic on a label. When we could afford it, my mother would place a bulk order with the co-op for tubs of tofu, bags of oats and pinto beans, buckets of blackstrap molasses, and bags of brewer's yeast. Those days were not gentle imprints. They were not glancing marks from casual use. They were dense and patina weathered paint on hardwood boards and their impressions remain 40 years on. I see steam vents rising from oatmeal in a house with frost on inside windows, cornmeal crusted sunfish fried in cast iron, twisted inside out with tails pulled through mouths, and my mother's ragged drop biscuits flecked with whole wheat flour. They were not lofty, they were not light, they weren't brushed with butter or made with lard, they were simple. They were cheap and they were dinner. Flour in the bowl, mixing, mixing, sorry. Flour in the bowl, baking powder, enough to cover the small dip between her palms, heart and lifelines, and a thimble of salt. In my mind's eye, Mama was near the stove, framed by a greasy fox pelt and cast iron corn pone pans hanging on a brick chimney. She hand mixed the dry and then made a well filled it with water and floated enough oil on top to cover the liquid surface. Stir, stir, scoop, drop, bake, and serve with honey or bruised yeast gravy. Biscuits for dinner, folk medicine made with the eye's measurement. We all have these memories, recollections which when summoned can transport us. 
Food traditions have a way of leaving marks, indelible ink, the whiff of which yanks us, whirling and swirling to lands beyond and long gone. But could I recreate these biscuits with my own palms? Would I, in some attempt to go back, use these warm forms of mean, as a means of travel to an old house in Arkansas? What is it about biscuits that brings weight beyond the measure of ingredients? Over my years as a baker, I've given innumerable loaves to friends, family, and strangers. And while each loaf carries something and was passed in earnest, I cannot say there's a more tender act than the sharing of biscuits. This gift, this simple mix of flour, milk, butter, salt, and leavening when eaten warm from the oven contains me, my heritage, my home, my upbringing, all that I am. And they have changed as I have. When I make them today, I fuss some, perhaps as Oma would, gently incorporating layers of cold butter and folding before cutting into small rounds. When no one's looking, I might even make them without measuring anything as Mama would. During baking, moisture in the butter expands, pushing upward before setting and transitioning, toasting to golden. Small hands can break them, separating tops from bottoms easily each half faring butter or jam or simply riding sidecar to a bowl of beans. I don't know what the old home would feel like today, but I do know that my heart is here in this very moment when I make biscuits. So that's some words from the beginning of the book. Thank you all for sitting and listening. Um, happy to talk all kinds of things, writing, baking, juggling, <laughs> and your playing. Decide to write a book. Um, it's funny because, um, so I went to King Arthur to work with a guy named Jeffrey Hamelman, who the bakers all know, right? Um, who I uh, was a mentor. And Jeffrey wrote a book that was very successful and has been translated into five languages or six languages now. So. People would say to me, well, you're kind of Jeffrey's right-hand guy now. Are you going to write a book? And I was always like, ugh, i got nothing to say. Like, what would I write about? I don't think I could write about baking. I felt like he had kind of said what needed to be said in some ways. Uh, but I don't know. I had been in this competition process, and as part of that, I'd done just like a little bit of writing. I'd written these very short little things to describe some breads that I was making, and it was really cool. It's like I had really enjoyed it. And then I also did some drawing for it, and... I had to get someone to take pictures, and so we sort of made this thing, and I thought, this would be fun, I would do this. If someone wanted me to do this, I would, I would try and do this, you know? I would try, I felt like I finally had something that would sort of, where I might be able to say something, or something where I could put words together that hopefully would be meaningful or inspiring on some level, and so, here I am. It worked out, I got lucky, I think, yeah. How long did it take? Um, I, I wrote it in uh, just over a year, and I was kind of writing on weekends. And then I, I basically I wrote the sort of what I call like the narrative portion this, uh, in a, just over a year and was working on the recipes all the time. And then they gave me a little bit more time to sort of wrap up the recipes and get everything tested and make sure that um, I knew what a volumetric measure of flour weighed and some of those things, and then get all the recipes proofed. And so. But uh, about a year, about a year of weekends, probably six months of weekends, and then the rest of the year just not coming up for air ever. <laughs> Between work and kids and everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. Fun. Rich. Rich. Yeah. Anybody else? So your book is lovely. Thank you. Um, thank you for writing it. Uh, we got it for my uh, for our 19 year old for Christmas, and before he went back to school, we got to have ciabatta, brioche, bagels, and three or four more, which was good. So worth wow. the investment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the book. All right. So, but uh, he has a couple questions. Okay. Um, Shoot. He's at school, but uh, so he wanted to understand how you got into finance in the first place yeah. and how you got from finance to bread baking because he felt like you elided that yeah. and yeah. wanted to know yeah. more. Yeah, good question. Um, so you maybe, answer whatever yeah. you feel comfortable I'll make it like, brief because... That was his question. Yeah, okay, I'll, an, I'll answer. I'll try and be brief because I feel like I... I Everybody I, takes a windy path. Yeah, no, it's definitely career. a windy path. Right. Um, so 
uh, moved to New York City because New York City is where you have to be if you're a professional. If you want to sing professionally in classical music, you kind of need to be in New York City because it's where it's like the clearinghouse for auditions, both nationally and internationally. And if you want to have artist representation, like management, you kind of have to be there and be available for auditions, right? And so we moved to New York City. My wife's also uh, a singer. And um, we're both just gutting it out. And I fell into doing some computer work at, uh, at an investment bank, which was first on just a temporary basis. Um, and I was working at night. And um, it was challenging, and I like a challenge. And so, I don't know, I was like I blinked, and all of a sudden I had like employees across the U.S. working for me, and you know, so I don't know how it happened, but uh, a lot of time in Excel. <laughs> um, but it didn't, it wasn't well aligned with me. I think I liked the challenge of it, but it just wasn't well aligned with yeah. me. And so I started looking for things that did align, you know, and uh, I think when I went to conservatory, I left my banjo at home. It should have been a little bit of a warning sign, you know, like don't go too far away from those things that you that resonate literally and figur figuratively, right? And so uh, I kind of, when I realized I was underwater a little bit, there were some points, you know, there were some like warning signs. And I think one of them was 9-11. I think that was a really good warning sign for me because it was a sort of before and after event. And I think different generations have those events, you know? Where were you when? Or what were these things that were pivotal at a national level? And that was something that, at least for my generation, uh, was pivotal. It was a measuring stick to me in a certain way that said, you know, here's what you're doing. And is, that, is this the life you want? You know, is this what you dreamed of? What happens if you get, someone asked me the question, I was in Portland last night, and someone asked me kind of a similar question, like, what, what led to the change? And I said, death. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like mortality, like we got to kind of take advantage of this. So, um, <coughs> yeah, so I was looking for things that had resonance. My parents, I grew up with my parents making all of our bread and I, uh, I was in California singing uh, a charity benefit for an AIDS organization and uh, I was at a homestay. My wife was with me and the guy who lived at the house was making bagels, like really good bagels. And he had this book. Daniel Leader's book, um, The Bread Alone Cookbook, and I opened it up and had these pictures of bread in it that were just bread, you know? It was like bread I hadn't seen. And I, I just went down this rabbit hole. It's like, I've got to be closer to that. However it is, get out of my way, like clawing and scratching, running with like gate mod and, you know, getting that. And I ran after it. And so, and then that's all it took, you know, that big carrot out in front of me. Does that help? Yeah. I covered both ends of that, right? How I got in and then how I got out. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> sure, I did a good job. Yeah. Did you grow up uh, playing the banjo? I did a little bit. Um, my mother, my mother did a few things um, with great intuition, and one of them was like 16th birthday, gave me a banjo, not a nice one like that, but a, a banjo, and um, it just, I don't know. I think that it was good for me to get back to that. It's the soundtrack of my youth, sort of, you know? And so I, when I kind of tried to turn my ship around and get going in a good direction again, it was one of the things I went back to. And, and so I wrote a book basically so that I can go around and play banjo. That's the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole thing. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what's next? Like you've, you've done, um, you're acting Arthur, yeah. you've written a yeah. book, you're playing the banjo. Can you follow a, Instagram? Like, yeah. So something about another proposal. I'm trying to, oh. yeah, I got another, I'm working on a proposal for a book that's kind of like a little bit of an obvious choice, like a, a farm to table book with a friend of mine who's an incredible career changing farmer. Uh, so I think we're kind of trying to work on something, but I have something bigger that I want to do. And I'll tell you what it is. Um, I think that we got to get back to talking. This is my like little soapbox. I think that we have to get back to talking, and not just to the people who we truck around with, you know, virtually or physically. But I think we've got to get back to talking, even to the people we don't necessarily agree with. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out a way that that I can use bread and baking and connection to reach across and get outside of my silo and get uncomfortable and go back to Arkansas and spend time in a blue state and talk to people and figure out what the hell is going on, you know? Because we've got to get back to treating people with respect and humanity, and I feel like we're broken right now, and I want to 
I want to move the bar on that and I want to use food to do that because we all need food. Food is our most human connection. Food is where community began. Think about the shape of a fire and people around a fire handing food and I don't care who you are and where you come from and whatever. Let's share some food and let's because it's our most common space. Food is our most common space. It's what we all share and uh, you know second to oxygen what do we share you know what do we have great commonality with so so um, I'm trying to find some space to work on that and get that sort of project going <coughs> Baker Maker Roadshow we call it the road show <laughs> in my house we call it the road show we got to get the road show going but uh, I want to ride around on a bicycle and bake with people I don't know wow. so in the rural south we'll see scary though it scares the hell out of me because <laughs> I'm gonna get upset <laughs> no you know any other questions baking writing angel picking please yeah what's your opinion on the I, I've been doing the no uh, need bread. no need yeah because it's just so easy it's so easy right yeah, yeah. I do I bake all yeah. my bread now that way Guess how many breads in this book are needed? None. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, and it's not because I, I think of like the no need method. I didn't do that purposefully. I, I like to follow a different way of making bread, which is what we call kind of like folding. Mm -hmm. Folding, mm -hmm. right? Folding sounds weird in terms of bread making, but um, the reason that we need uh, and the reason that we fold is to develop strength within the dough environment. Strength is what helps us build the bread skyscraper instead of the the bread, you know, flying carpet. You know what I'm saying? So strength, um, gluten is what gives us that structural integrity to build the nice bread skyscraper, right? And so kneading is one way to do that. In the professional environment, we use mixers, specific mixers often called spiral mixers, um, to form strength within the dough environment. But we can also get strength via a process that we refer to as folding. And folding is basically um, when you add flour and water together, you have kind of a chaotic environment. There's not a lot of organization. It's like if you're knitting a sweater and you start by taking a, a skein of yarn and you put it in the blender for a couple <laughs> minutes. You, know? you get all these tiny pieces, right? That's kind of what's in the flour bag before it's hydrated, right? You hydrate it and you still have this kind of unorganized network. Via kneading or developing in a spiral mixer or folding, we knit together this environment essentially building these long strands of yarn with which we can knit a beautiful sweater or scarf like you have, right? So, um, so folding is the way that we can develop strength within the dough environment. Um, no need method, like the Jim Leahy, Mark Bittman method that became popular, um, develops dough using hydration and time also. So it's a viable way to develop strength in that environment. And I think it's a great, like, gateway drug to serious baking, you know, because it's like you can kind of do it, you mix it together, it's got a small quantity of yeast, it has good fermentation flavor because it's left out at room temperature for 12 to 14, 16 or more hours, depending on whether or not you remember it, um, right? Um, to my palate, I, I kind of, I tried it a few times and then I moved away from it a little bit because I felt like there was an excess of certain flavors when each time I would try it, and so I wanted to have a little bit more control over the fermentation. Um, and so, uh, so I think that, you know, I have s all the breads in the book have bulk fermentation, what we call bulk fermentation, which is the period of time after the, after the mix and before the shape, right? There's this sort of period of time. Um, but it's more controlled, and uh, um, I think but I do, I do think that that no need method can be really good, you know, for making a good basic bread. And I think it's a great way to see, like, ooh, am I interested in this? And do I want to get a little bit more sciency about it, or am I making bread that everybody's eating? So why, why complicate it if it ain't broke, right? Dang, <laughs> keep them coming. So yeah, um, but I think it's a totally viable method, um, uh, and one of many to, you know, that you can use to make great bread for sure. To answer it, did I, did I opine yeah, yeah. and frame it sort of yeah. somewhat? I mean, it's very accessible. There's yeah, people, super accessible. Tried it, you know. Yeah, and are you baking in a Dutch oven? Is yeah. that how you do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way to bake at home. If you haven't mm -hmm. tried that, that's a really good way to bake at home. 
uh, it's a good way to make a nice crusty loaf without too much fuss, you know, because that's one of the challenges in the home environment is to um, get the steam down and, you know, sort of make this mockery of the masonry oven that we have at King Arthur and at Red Hen also, nice big ovens with lots of thermal mass and uh, you're baking right on the hearth, you know, so you get um, radiant heat, you get convection, you get um, conduction, you know, all these different kinds of heat that combine to make um, great bread, great crusty bread. So you can sort of make your own miniature masonry oven via the use of a Dutch oven or a cloche or, you know, there are a lot of different hacks for sort of making that. With the lid on? Yeah, with the lid on because um, during baking, you know, a loaf will lose 10 to 15 percent of its moisture uh, and so it actually weighs less when it comes out of the oven than when it went in. So if you bake inside a pot, that moisture is sort of self-steaming. And if you're baking in a moist environment, it's like when you put the bread in the oven, it's like putting like a shirt on that's one size too small and then, you know, you go to the gym and you work out and it's like, Meh, you're ripping out of the shirt now. That's kind of what happens in the dough environment in that when the yeasts begin to heat up to a certain point, maybe 96 degrees, their activity increases and increases, gas production increases, loaf volume increases, oven spring happens. If you do that in a moist environment, it allows the loaf to expand even further rather than sort of feeling straight jacketed because what will happen is the exterior will dry and then the loaf is sort of constricted. But if it's in a moist environment, like inside your pot with the lid on for the first two thirds only of baking, um, you get nice expansion, it self steams, you take the lid off, leave it in the pan to finish or pop it out and let it finish just on a rack in the oven and it's a great way to mimic the professional oven in the home environment. You do that with a loaf that you're making right now and I guarantee you'll be like, woo, I've never made that bread before because the quality I think will probably be significantly better. Yeah, yeah, please. So um, this is sort of the flip of that, if you don't have a lot of time yeah. don't have the time for Right. right. What, what suggestions for developing flavor yeah. quickly? Yeah. Do? So, do you want to do it quickly or do you want to do it in without a lot of active time? You know what I'm saying? No, quickly. Quickly. So it's like <laughs> I get home at five and I want bread at six. Darn it. <laughs> yeah. Pull it yeah. the freezer, care. <laughs> you know, it's it's hard. And the analogy that I always use, and I always wonder, I, I think it's okay to make, but tell me if it's not. I always say you can't take nine women and make a baby in one month. You know what I mean? It's like, you, you can't, like, it's, okay? it's, it's, it's a linear, it's, you know, you can't compress it necessarily. If I were going to do that, um, what I would do would be to make things like crackers and, you know, which you can make with 100% whole wheat flour and you can roll them through tons of healthy seeds and they bake up really quickly and you can have them with dinner. Or I make things like roti, which is a whole wheat naan, whole wheat version of naan, which can be ready relatively quickly. Um, remember that in addition to fermentation, like fermentation is also digestibility to some degree as it relates to the bread environment. So not only are you increasing flavor, but you're increasing digestibility, phytic acid breaks down. There's some good nutritional benefits to like having that longer process. But what I would encourage you to do is to think about, so bread making happens over a long period of time, but with little active work. It's kind of like it needs a check-in. It's like our chickens, you know? I go out and check on them in the morning. Up, oh, here's your fresh water, here's your gruel. I'll see you at, you know, five o'clock and we'll see how things are going. Um, it takes a little planning and I understand that that's like, mm, that can be a pain in the butt. I totally get that. Um, so I would say if you want to do it quickly, you know, I think the best thing to do is to go grab a loaf of red hair <laughs> and do it that way. And then spend your time making a delicious meal to accompany your loaf of bread, you know what I'm saying? Um, because there really is no shortcut for fermentation. It just takes time. Um, but if you can sort of look at your process, you know, you can set a pre-ferment uh, the night before. In the morning you can get up and you can do a quick mix. Um, if you let it ferment in a cool place, you can use thermal factors to slow down the rate of fermentation. That sounds a little bit complicated, but you know, yeast and bacterial um, activity uh, is slower in colder environments, so there's some ways to do some massaging, but I would say that's like bread 201 as opposed to like the first thing you want to try because it's a little bit more like juggling knives than 
you know. But uh, you know, give it a shot. See how it goes. Eat your mistakes. I, I make a lot of uh, the no need. Bread. Yeah. So well, I mean, there's normal nothing. Normal routine takes yeah. days. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think there's nothing wrong with doing that method. You know, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that method, and I think that you probably get great flavor, right? It's great. Yeah. And you found ways to add grains and whole grain content that is also a way to add flavor. So, I don't think your bread making process is broken. It sounds like you're making it. Straight yeah. up, Walter Sands. Beginning to end, three hours. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. Here's some breads, and I put some breads in the book, and there are lots of breads out there that are like a 90-minute bulk or even an hour bulk, so an hour to 90-minute bulk, you know. Um, and then you got the rise, too, you know, so sorry. <laughs> that's pretty fast, though. Yeah, that's pretty fast. It's an afternoon, you know. Yeah, my, I used to, my mom made a lot of bread, and I remember coming home, and it's like, you know, it's like down the counter kind of thing, you know. It's yeah. like, I don't know, no one died. <laughs> do your kids bake with you? They do some baking. My middle child has her own cupcake business called The Perfect Cupcake. Uh, but I'm trying no to kind of, there. yeah, I'm trying to like steer her away from it a little bit, but um, just because it's like you sugar, sugar, cake. sugar, you know. But the cupcakes are fun. It's fun to watch her play with flavor and think about flavor, and that's that's really fun. Um, yeah, but she got an order um, around Christmas for a bridal shower from '96, <laughs> and she's like, you know 12 years old. You know, <laughs> it's like she's sort of looking at me, and I'm going, "Yeah, I'll, I mean, I, I'm not going to help you, but um, <laughs> but somehow I'm on the hook for the ingredient cost. We got to talk about, we got to talk business plan here, you know. <laughs> but she's got her, she's got her business cards and her tote bag with perfect cupcake on it, and she's got the containers for, you know. So it's it's fun, it's fun, it's important. Making's fun, right? It's fun. Yeah. Any questions? Yes, please. About King Arthur. Okay. I mean, I love King Arthur, but if you get their catalog, everything is a box. Everything is a box. Oh, the yeah. mixes. Yeah. yeah, there are a lot of mixes, you know. <coughs> and, um, yeah, we're trying to, um, we're trying to find our way to better communication and contact with serious home bakers. Mm -hmm. And so I actually spent all of last week uh, with eight people in a conference room developing a prototype for a resource that would be like a really high premier resource for high-end bakers who are serious about baking with natural leavens and all of that. So um, a lot of what you see are the mixes, but then dig in a little bit and you'll see some flours and grain blends and things like that that are helpful. But there are a lot of people who are trying to figure out baking and for a lot of people the easy way to begin is with the mix. and. Um, there's a whole line called Essential Goodness where they've really tried to get a very short, the shortest possible ingredient list into a mix. Um, but it's still a big portion of what people want. And so we're trying to move the bar on that by influencing content and reaching to people who are really interested in scratch baking. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Mm -hmm. The classes are fun. Though. Yeah, classes People are fun. I'd say fell into America. Yeah. Right? I fell into America. I yeah. Mean, that's true. yeah, I just yeah. took a class a couple of weeks ago for um, a ciabatta bread, mm -hmm. and last year I took one for phyllo bread. And the classes are not targeted to, um, um, like, their product. Mm -hmm. You know, they're really targeted to understanding the science of what's going on mm -hmm. and um, having a real hands-on experience with with someone supporting you as far as your space and, mm -hmm. yeah, and all of that. And so it's not just like, in my experience was that, not that, um, so yeah, it was ciabatta bread, but I learned a lot about, you know, like the temperature of things and how the gluten works mm -hmm. and, and all of that stuff so that I got a broader understanding. Because I do a lot of baking, but not a lot with yeast. So that was what I was looking for. Um, um, and I certainly came away with a lot of that. Um, and it was very, I mean, and when you come away, it's successful. What you have is successful. Mm -hmm. um, and I've taken a phyllo class, too, and um, which sounds complicated, but um, the class is not. Um, mm -hmm. But I would definitely try try one of the classes. I mean, they're, they take three or four hours, or depending on what it is. Um, and you really do come away with a beautiful product, a lot of information, and um, it's really well organized. They're really well organized, yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. They got the timing down like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah.
Not to promote King. Thanks. <laughs> Why not? Anybody have any other questions? You'd play something else on the banjo? Yeah, I'd love to play. I'd love to play, for sure. I'm just going to put a few books up yeah. here and let you know um, you're welcome to purchase a book. The registers are downstairs, and I'm sure he will sign them. I can't yeah. believe that this man can bake bread, write books, and play the banjo. <laughs> what know, can't he right? do? We've got to have some hobbies. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> an old tune. Tune in banjo, it's like uh, the weather in Vermont, you know, if you don't like it, just wait. <laughs> this banjo is made in North Carolina with, um, in Asheville, and all the woods from right around Asheville is walnut with uh, this nice little piece of persimmon, and then all the hardware is made in the U.S. So I, I finally, so it feels nice to play that.